Well, good morning and happy new year, church. Wow. That was a lot less lively than the worship service. Okay. Good morning and happy new year, church. Happy new year. Oh, that's, the, that's a good start. What a blessing it is to come and share the word of God with you this morning. Um, my name is Josiah Spence. If, for those of you who don't know me, I'm actually the men's director here. And um, if you have your Bibles, as Jerry mentioned, please turn to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Just a few pages over from what you just read. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. As you're turning there, I'd like you to imagine yourself as an Olympic long-distance runner in the ancient Greco-Roman world. I want you to picture yourself walking into the Colosseum filled to capacity and hearing the roar of that crowd. And after being in awe of that crowd, I want you to, in your mind, glance down at your feet, look inward, and remember how you got there. To remember the strenuous training that pushed you to your limits. To remember the words of your coach, which were to stay in your lane, lift your legs, and lean forward at the finish. To remember is the, the runners that came before you. They're examples of perseverance and grace, grit and sacrifice, these former champions who serve as a personal testimony of what it looks like to run a race with endurance and finish well. And now in your mind, I want you to approach your lane and remove your outer garments, making your way to the start line. And as you kneel down in your starting stance, Silence. Before that great horn, the crowd erupts as you and the rest of the runners spring from your start positions, and all that is left to do is all that you came to do. Run. Run, remembering the example of those who were crowned. Run without anything weighing you down. Run the race that is set before you with endurance. Run with your eyes on the prize. Let's share a word of prayer before we dive into our text. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. And as you send it forth to accomplish what you purpose, I pray that you would accomplish what it is that you purpose through it. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we thank you for the riches and the grace that we have in Christ and looking forward into this new year, we pray with eyes that are fixed on him and hearts that don't give up. In Jesus' name, amen. The foot race was one of the most popular events in the Greco-Roman games, and it's actually served as the perfect metaphor for the Christian life. Especially for believers who would be reading this letter. Around A.D. 70, Jewish Christians, or Hebrews, living in Rome faced severe persecution, tempting many of them to shrink back in their faith as a means to avoid harm and public shame. And it wasn't as though these Christians were new to suffering. No, no, no. Hebrews 10.32 tells us that after they were enlightened by the gospel, they endured hard struggles with suffering, with many of them being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction. It wasn't that they had been shell-shocked by their suffering. They were languishing in it really going through it. It's no wonder that they were tempted to throw away their faith and confidence and to shrink back from following Christ. All they would need to do to avoid their suffering, return to the old Levitical system, live by the law of Moses in their Jewish community, keep their mouth shut under Roman rule. And in Hebrews 10, 36, the writer tells these Christians that they had need of endurance the grit to keep going in their faith, and the commitment to finish strong. And I would submit to you today that for our church, this is a word in season, we have a need for endurance. Yes, we're living in a completely different time and context than they are. But even here in 2023, who knows that these God-breathed words still have relevance today. They speak to us even today. Most of us are actually not beginning this race of faith today with the same fervor that we had when we first came to Christ, are we? Most of us have actually been running this race for years, likely through difficult terrain, 
winding bends and besetting hindrances as we run our race of faith. For those of you who have ever run a long distance race or run for long distances, you know that running is difficult after you run for a long time. And the same can be said about persevering in our faith as Christians through hard things. This is why running is a consistent metaphor throughout the New Testament for Christians enduring in their faith. In 1 Corinthians 9.24, Paul uses that same imagery noting that the race of faith is a race that all runners win to win a prize. Elsewhere in Philippians 3.14, he speaks of pursuing Christ in faith as a runner who is straining forward, pressing onward to the goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And in 2 Timothy 4.7, he pens those famous words to Timothy at the end of his life, having endured in the faith, about to be beheaded. And he says to Timothy, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Saints, the Christian life is like a race, a long-distance race that is not a sprint, a race that requires endurance, a race that all believers are required to run. And if you are a believer here today under my voice, you are running that race right now. And as I reflected on our text before this new year, I asked myself some questions, and the first was personal, and it was this. How am I, as a Christian, to continue running the race that is set before me? How am I, as a Christian, to continue running the race that is set before me? The second was a more corporate question for our church. How are we, as Hope Markham, to posture ourselves in the race of faith this new year and onward. We'll find these answers in our text. Look with me there now. Hebrews 12, 1 to 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. In our passage here, the author has actually just capped off three chapters worth of encouragement to endure in the faith. And he imagines the Christian in a Colosseum that is surrounded by spectators, spectators that he refers to as a cloud of witnesses. Now, these spectators aren't the traditional spectators. They aren't Greco-Roman citizens cheering Christians on for their faith in Christ. Neither are they Jewish kinsmen that wish them well on their new entrance into faith in Christ after believing the gospel. No, these, this cloud of witnesses here are the saints of old listed in the chapter before Hebrews 11. These are men and women who were commended through their faith to God. These saints who lived with the assurance of things that they hoped for and, con and were convinced of the realities of the things that they yet did not see. These were men like Abraham, who obeyed God by leaving his homeland, traveling to the land of promise, though he didn't know where he was going, to receive the, one, the, 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 the land that God had promised him and given, him, given to him as an inheritance. These were women like Sarah, Abraham's wife, who received the power to conceive by her faith, even though she was past the age of childbearing. Leaders like Moses, who by faith refused the honor and privilege of being called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. And we could go on speaking about Abel, Enoch, Noah, or Rahab, and many other saints of old who died believing in God's promises, even though they did not see them fulfilled in their lifetime. And yet, they endured to the end of their lives, knowing that God was, is, and always will be faithful to his promises. For us, these individuals serve not as spectators in the traditional sense. Samson's not in heaven right now saying, yeah, go, Josiah, go. He's not saying that right now. 
okay? These people don't serve as spectators in the traditional sense. They are rather witnesses, witnesses who have testified with their lives that God is faithful to his word. These witnesses serve as examples for us to imitate, to endure in our faith before we cross the finish line into glory. And this is why, according to our text, we are to imitate the faith of these witnesses by laying aside the weights and the sins in order that we might run with endurance. Look back with me at verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. You can see that let us, let us, let us lay aside every weight. Let us run with endurance. So the author is putting himself in that same position as the Christians he is writing to. He is running this race with him like an Olympic-level runner. And by the way, Olympic-level runners, they eat and they train to strip excess weight off their bodies. And before they run their race, they remove all of their clothing or almost all of it that they might remove anything that weighs them down or restricts their movements. And according to our text, we as Christians here at Hope Markham have the same responsibility, just in a spiritual sense. We are to lay aside every weight and sin that weighs us down and hinders our progress as we run the race of faith. The meaning of laying aside in the Greek gives a picture of someone who is laying something down and also pushing it far beyond their reach. This is a picture that implies that any Christian who wants to run this race of faith needs to remove motives, attitudes, and behaviors that spring from something that the Bible calls unbelief. They do so as a runner would remove weighted garments. You see, we as Christians must also, not also cast off spiritual hindrances. We must also separate ourselves from it intentionally, making no provision for the lusts of the flesh. Romans 13, 14 says this, Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. This is how seriously we must treat these things that weigh ourselves down. Because unbelief can lead to us giving up in the race. And again, this is the big reason why the author of Hebrews is using this picture and writing these words. He's writing to Christians who are in this context weighed down by their unbelief. Some of them were weighed down by their reliance on old Levitical systems with legalism and sacrifices for sin. They were tempted to believe what? That Christ wasn't enough, that Christ alone wasn't sufficient for their faith. And after facing grueling bouts of persecution, they were also weighed down by lingering doubt that God would not see them through their sufferings and reward their faith. Now, their legalism and their unbelief are weights that slowed them down in their progress in the faith. And indeed, we too also have to lay aside Many other weights that weigh us down in our faith, don't we? Like the weight of distraction, that being a huge one for myself. The weight of unresolved conflict. The weights of shame and guilt often associated with either our own sin or the sin of another against us. What about this? The weight of ungodly influence. If you're a young Christian here today, if you've come to faith recently, you have to know that bad company corrupts good character. That's a weight on your faith, ungodly influence. And I got to admit, I'm, I'm actually hindered in my running, often due to weights like these and sins that so easily entangle me, sins that so easily set me back as I run, also known as besetting sins. What sins are besetting you? Is it the tongue that can't be tamed? Is it the lust that just won't be quenched? Is it the appetite that won't be satisfied? Is it your anger that cannot be quelled? Is it your pride that refuses to be humbled? 
Even though we're redeemed and running by faith, our indwelling sin seeks to weigh us down right to a halt in the race that is set before us. So we must do our due diligence, saints. We must be watchful not to give our flesh an opportunity. We also must refuse to believe the lie that we are still slaves to sin. If you're a Christian here today, you are no longer a slave to sin. You're a slave to Christ. Sin's power has been broken in your life by Christ. And in him, you too can put it to death by simply repenting and believing the gospel. Remembering that God is faithful to deliver you from that sin as he has in an ultimate sense already through Christ. This is how we run. And it's important that we do this in stride daily, laying our sin aside, laying those weights aside, that we might be found finishing the race. And this is why the encouragement from our text is to run the race set before us with endurance. That's why we lay aside these weights and sins. It's so that we can not only run, but keep running. Look back at verse 1 with me. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. If we are going to imitate the faith of those in Hebrews 11, we not only need to lay aside anything that's going to hinder us, we also need to run this race that is set before us with endurance. If any race is to be won, it must be run with effort and commitment. And this is, perfect, this is perfectly pictured in the long distance race. And the same is true of us for Christians in the Christian life. According to William Barclay, Christians need to possess a determination that is unhurried and undelayed, an active refusal to give up or turn back. And this is how we are to run with unyielding, enduring faith in our faithful God. When sickness comes our way, we keep going. When we are mistreated by others, we stay in stride. When we don't get that job, we keep our pace. When a loved one passes away and our hearts are ripped out of our chest, we don't give up in faith. We press on. Just as the first readers of this letter, we too are going to be facing different levels and circumstances of suffering this year. Some of us are even going to be persecuted for our faith. But in the midst of things, are we going to give up? No. No. By God's grace, we're going to run with endurance. In fact, I often look to the Apostle Paul as an example of an endurance. And in Acts 20, 24, he said this, I do not count my life of any value nor as precious to myself. If I may only finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. That was Paul's race and he was committed to finishing it, no matter the hindrance, even if there was a possibility of him dying. And like Paul, we must be willing to endure any and all obstacles, running our race to the end with Jesus at our focus, as our focus, as our text now says in verse 2. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Every runner intent on winning the race strides forth with their eyes on the finish line. And in the same way, Christians are to have that same singular focus as they run, except the Christian is to run their race with their eyes fixed on Christ. Here in, Greek, here in uh, verse 2, the Greek word translated looking is actually more comprehensive than you might think at first glance. There's a preposition in this word that denotes a person looking away from everything else to fix their gaze on an object of focus. That means for us, 
If we're going to be looking to the witnesses of Hebrews 11 for inspiration without seeing Christ in view, that too will be in vain. And yes, we must identify the weights and the sins that beset us, but we must avoid becoming fixated on them, for even that will hinder our progress. We must look away from all to Christ. To the weary saints in our church, You're running, and it feels like you can barely breathe. Your legs, they're barely moving in your faith. You're running with your head down, lacking zeal, and you're doubting your ability to finish the race. What is the word of God saying to you today? It's saying, look up, look to Christ, look to Jesus. Did not the the founder of your faith begin the good work of salvation in you? Will Christ not preserve those who are persevering? Will God not give strength to the weary as he's promised in Isaiah 40? Will the perfecter of your faith leave your salvation unfinished? May it never be. Even when we are faithless, he is faithful for he cannot deny himself. This is who our God is, church. Faithful to the end. Faithful to see us to the end. There is no other object worthy of our attention or more worthy of our attention than Christ. Jesus, the only innocent man in human history, past, present, and future, who laid down his life for wretched, undeserving sinners. Jesus, the only begotten Son of God with whom God the Father was well pleased, dying accursed on a cross to satisfy the wrath of his God and Father, for wretched sinners. Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, possessing infinite glory and worthiness, shamed by the mockery and beatings that, uh, before being put to death by vile men that he was praying for in his last moments. Jesus, who endured the cross, despised the shame, and sat down at the right hand of, of God his Father in glory. This is the Jesus that we're looking to. And saints, let's not take our eyes off him this year. Because we're all looking to something, are we? We're all looking to something. Some of us are looking to ourselves to fulfill goals of self-improvement. To to plot our own course, to be the, the, the captain of our own ship. My question to you is, Who or what are you going to be looking to in 2023 when you leave this service? Are you going to be looking to Christ or are you going to be looking to something else? Will you resolve today to look different than this world that is looking to rely on themselves to accomplish things? Will you look away from yourself and look to Christ and rest in the finished work of Christ on your behalf? By grace, you can do that today, and you can run with endurance in your faith. Perhaps you haven't even started running this race. Maybe someone invited you today, or you've been thinking that you've been running this race, but as I've been preaching, you've realized, I haven't been running at all. I would invite you, by the power of God in Christ, to surrender your life to the Lordship of Christ today, to get on that starting line, and to join us, to join us as we run to glory. One of the ways that we can, church, fix our eyes on Jesus is by participating in communion.